Okay, so now I want to talk about extrinsic curvature. So extrinsic curvature, extrinsic curvature. And so we wanted to, so we, we established an equation. We established a relationship between the Christoffel symbols and the metric tensor. And this relationship was, uh, is commonly known as the ex or the intrinsic formula for the Christoffel symbols. Uh, now we want to consider the extrinsic formula. So the extrinsic formula basically says we don't refer to G. We refer to the, mo the motion of the vectors themselves within the space-time. So again, G is a property of space-time. It's something that's located at every point in space. So if we don't invoke G in, in in some sort of equation, then that means the equation is um, extrinsic in some sense. We're not referring to the space-time itself. And it's actually possible to do this for the Christoffel symbol or this affine connection. And so I'm going to start off by considering uh, the derivative. Actually, before I even start off with the derivative, I'm going to start off with the picture. All right, so the picture looks a little something like this. Suppose we have uh, this is some curve in space, and at some point in the space, we have some vector r. Okay, and then at at some point, at some time interval, call at some small time interval, epsilon. Our vector is now like this. And we want to know, say this curve is parameterized by lambda. So as we march along the curve, we increase our values of lambda. And we want to know what is, how does the vector change? How does the vector r change with respect to lambda? Okay. So we could start this off by saying, well, this is equal to du d lambda times this partial derivative of r with respect to u, where u again is the r is a function. Uh, r this r vector, r vector can be thought of as something that has components to it. It might have in two dimensions. It might have a u and a v component. Right, so R is, in this case, a two-dimensional vector that is traveling along some curve, and it has two components. Right, so we want to know, so we can calculate dr d lambda by saying, well, this, the d, the, how we want to look at how the component, the u component changes with respect to the parameter, and multiply it by this. And by the chain rule, we can also say, dv d lambda partial r partial v okay this is simple chain rule kind of stuff simple calculus theoretically the the way you could picture this is these guys ultimately cancel and we get dr d lambda again but we don't want to cancel that we want to expand this out and see what happens Okay, so now let's consider the double derivative. So this is sort of the derivative. Let's consider the double derivative. So the double derivative with respect to lambda would be merely this right here. So that's an R. It's a weird looking R. I'll rewrite that like that. D lambda. This here is merely the second derivative. And we're always interested in curvature, and curvature is uh, in, sort of defined by second derivatives, not first derivatives. So this again is equal to all of this up here. So I could put that in parentheses. So du d lambda dr d 
du plus dv d lambda dr dv. Okay. And now we could say, the pen's bugging out again. Oh, there we go. So now we could say, well, we that we can do we can do this. We could say, well, d d lambda. This is equal to d d lambda times just this part. D u d lambda d r d u plus d d lambda d v d lambda d r d v we're just kind of breaking this apart there's n nothing wrong with doing that and now we want to consider now with this here so we can do the chain rule again so this is equal to the double derivative d squared the double derivative of u with respect to d lambda squared that's this part right here and then we can also do this part right here so that's going to be that's going to be plus plus du uh, d lambda d lambda dr du like that and then we do the same thing here where we have d squared v d lambda squared for the second derivative of v plus dv d lambda times dr actually not dr d d lambda dr d v like that all right so now if we keep on trudging along here let's find this guy right here we want to find these guys what are they, what are they equal to? Okay, well, this here, this guy inside here, right, is going to be. Actually, I'll be a little bit more clear. Let's just do the inside of these. Let's do this guy right here. Is going to be. Well, this is du. D lambda. D D U plus D V D lambda D V D lambda D D V operating. This is an operator. All right, so we have this operator operating on this right here. All right, so we have D R du like that okay same thing here so for this guy this is going to be the same thing d u d lambda d d u plus d v d lambda d d v operating on this guy right here so dr dv like that so if we were to then uh, multiply things out we will find so we apply this guy to here so we're going to get du d lambda times d squared r over du squared plus d 
dv d lambda d squared r dv squared. Okay, and same thing here. So this is going to be du d lambda d squared r. Um, oh, oh, actually, I misspoke here. This actually should be dv du, dv du. Here's du dv, du dv, plus dv d lambda d squared r dv squared, like this. All right, so then we can actually plug all of this back in. And what we get is this guy. So d squared u d lambda squared plus du d lambda times all of this. So du d lambda d squared r by du squared plus dv d lambda d squared r d v du plus this guy right here which is d uh, that would be d squared v d lambda squared plus dv d lambda by, let's see here, this guy in here. So du d lambda d squared r du dv plus dv d lambda d squared r dv squared. Okay, so far so good. Now we can break this apart even more, right? So we can, we'll have, so we can, what we can do is we could say, well, we can do this guy right here. We'll do this in a different color. These kind of get applied to him, and then he can get, also get applied to this factor. And same thing here. And what do we get? You will get something that looks like this. So we have our d squared u d lambda squared plus this here is going to be du du d lambda times du d lambda times d squared r by du lambda or d squared and then plus du d lambda, d v, d lambda, d squared r, that's going to be d v, and that's going to be d u, okay, and then plus this guy, d squared v by d lambda squared. This might be all very esoteric at first because th these are all symbols that we could do we could very easily get lost with and then we have dv d lambda times du d lambda times dr squared by du dv plus dv d lambda uh, squared actually or actually, we'll just do it like this, dv 
D lambda, because I did the same thing right here. D squared R by DV squared. Okay, so now how can we, so now what can we do to condense all this? Well, if we notice, if, if we notice really quickly, we have, let's see here, so these guys, I will use a different color here. So if I took a look at, it's very hard to see this color. If I took a look at this guy right here, this guy right here, this guy right here, and this guy right here. Well, U and V are just components. Right? U and V are, so we could put a, we could put upper indices on these if we went to some overall possible permutations of these indices. Right. And similarly, we have the same thing with this U and this V right here. So this U right here and this V right here. So if we wanted to put this in summation form, in Einstein's summation form, it would look a little something like this. If I can remember what that equation looked like, it is going to look like the sum over i and j of d squared u i by d lambda squared plus, let me double check really quick, uh, and we want the d R D U I here also. We want the this D R D U I right there plus D U I D lambda D V I D lambda. So that would be these combo terms right here and right here and those other ones uh, do 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 and then we want to do d squared r by d u i d u j like that um, yeah, let's I actually want to, we can call this guy U because the I's and J's are what's going to distinguish them. So that's a U, make that look like more like a J. And then the, here's our condensed term for, okay, what is this equal again? I always like to do this. I always like to come back and tell myself, well, what exactly does this equal? This equals the double, this equals the double derivative, this guy right here. This is d dr d lambda. So, okay, so this here is an expression for the double derivative of dr by d lambda. So if we were to say, if we were to set, so these guys here, this is, this right here is sort of standard chain rule. Right? This guy is a little bit different. This guy right here, we see that it's a combination. It's, it, it tells, this guy here is a little bit different. It's this sort of this double derivative with respect to ui and uj. And so what do we make of this? Well, we're going to set this d, we're going to set this guy. So d squared r by d u i d d u j. We're going to set that guy. We're going to, if we were to multiply it by, uh, let's see, how do I want to do this? 
we're going to set this equal actually we, we want to set it e we want to set him equal to gamma our Christoffel symbol all right my pen's bugging out again M we'll put an M right here and then I J and D R D U M. So if we were to set if we were to set this guy equal to this, well, what are what's going to be the consequence of that of setting of doing that? Well, we could say that if we were to multiply this side by if we were to multiply both sides so if we were to multiply both sides d u i d u j to multiply both sides by d r d u l for example this is just again the derivative this is like the, this is this guy is like this guy right here but with respect to u's these guys right here we have to do the same to the other side so we get d so m Christoffel on m and i j and its corresponding basis d u m I say basis, um, I haven't really got formally gone over this realization of this being a basis yet, but I, we'll do that later. What is it? Right now we're just doing some brute math. And then we multiply this by D R uh, D U L. All right, so we really didn't do anything. We just multiplied both sides by the same thing. But we could see here, this here is uh, actually, by virtue of calling these bases, um, this is actually equal to, uh, how do I want to do this, M L. This is actually our metric tensor, because this is an inner product between two, two bases, it's two sort of bases vectors and, and the reason I say it's sort of the inner product between two basis vectors is because the derivative we'll go into this a little bit in more in depth but the derivative can act as if it's like a basis where you have uh, w w when we talked about our, our vector a mu when we talked about our vector a mu its basis what we said earlier was something like this where it it is it sir it's orthogonal all the bases are are orthogonal but um they also obey the rules of linearity and by virtue of obeying the rules of linearity well again we'll go over this later these derivatives these derivatives they don't they're not necessarily always going to be orthogonal to each other but they they serve as a very good basis for a very good generalized uh, basis to the point where we could say something like this a mu like that where this guy is our basis so if we add a function on this manifold this basis applies itself to that function right and then we have this guy left to deal with but the point again is that because because dx dx dy and dz um, are because these things can obey the rules of linearity, we can say that they they provide a very good. There's nothing really stopping us from saying well. We can use them as a basis. 
they're not necessarily an orthogonal basis, but we can use them as a basis nonetheless. And the inner product between the two, if we remember, E1, actually I'll, I'll do it like this, we have, we have D mu, D nu, well this is the same thing as G mu nu. Okay, this is a fundamental relationship where the basis on the metric tensor, the basis on the metric on the metric tensor, is the basis uh, is the it's a combination of of bases from from vectors and covectors. So, and uh, again, I haven't really gone over that yet and I will very shortly. The point is that derivatives can serve as good bases. Okay. So with that being said, we have d squared r d u i uh, d u j by this basis right here d U L is equal to M I J M L like that. Now all we have to do is if we want to bring this guy to this side here, we can say that we have we have D uh, D squared r by dui duj times the derivative r with respect to dul times g m or g m or ml equals m i j like that and this becomes our extrinsic curvature this is our extrinsic curvature now I initially I had said that the extrinsic curvature doesn't contain the metric tensor it actually this it actually does this is just a um, I think I was getting confused with something else, but this is extrinsic, extrinsic curvature. And we could, and so, so one of the things you might ask yourselves is, we kind of just defined, we kind of just defined this to be, to, to, we kind of just define this and nowhere did we invoke the actual definition that we proposed for this guy. Uh, so how in the world can this, this equal, how in the world can this equal what we proposed in our, in our intrinsic curvature formula, which was this guy right here. Well, we, we said we just defined, let's see, where did I put it? We just defined it to be how come I cannot find it? It is um, right here. Here we go. We defined it to be this right here. So where does it? Where does that definition show up in here? Well, it actually shows up right in here, right here. Uh, where, if we look at this, if we can compare, this is that basis we were talking about. Okay. So we can see how, I'll actually just write that guy in here. So that guy, so we can see them side by side. We have that 
this is equal to e d e i d u j so we have our i and our j and then our e m uh, e m right here right so we have this derivative uh, let's see it shows up right if we were to multiply these guys if we were to multiply this guy right here by this guy in here we'll find out we inevitably find out that this indeed is true like th this is actually true because we can bring this to one side where it's a basis and we have this guy right here already and so we find that the equation for our extrinsic curvature looks like this and if we remember our intrinsic curvature formula it's one half g m i times d k of g i j I'm just rewriting the intrinsic curvature so this is our extrinsic our intrinsic is plus d j uh, k i minus d i g j k this is our intrinsic formula I should probably say formula instead of curvature because we have uh, curvature tensors, extrinsic curvature tensors that we'll come across later. So we'll call this a formula. Formula. And this is our, this is our ij, like that. This is our intrinsic guy right here. We see that the extrinsic formula contains derivatives of the vector as it travels through some space along a parameterized curve. And this guy is solely in terms, the extrinsic or intrinsic curvature is solely in terms of g i j. This is some inherent property of our space time. And again, so before I close, before I close, again, I want to reiterate how important this in this Christoffelsen board, this affine connection is. The affine connection again tells us how it tells us something about the double derivative, or how, what's the double derivative of R as it travels along the parameterized curve with respect to its basis. So how does the how does R change? How does this function change, or does the vector change, as we travel in different directions? Right. This. That's basically what this is telling us. It's it's telling us the double derivative with respect to two different directions of our of our vector. Okay. And then we came across this idea of the affine connection, which is this guy, and the spin connection. The spin connection is a little bit more interesting, in my opinion, because this is, the spin connection will allow us to begin to introduce quantum gravity, right? Uh, and concepts in, in quantum mechanics and how we can begin to perhaps invoke things like loop quantum gravity, covariant uh, covariant quantum gravity and all this kind of stuff and um, yes yeah, so, so with that being said I think I will stop the video here and we will move on to the next subject which I think is probably going to be the covariant derivative if I don't get too 
the equivalence principle before that. But I hope this video has been helpful, and I will see you in the next one. Thanks.